So, in the early days of the channel, I did a video called Can Star Trek Discovery Be Reconciled? in which I broke down how I did a rescale of the various ships seen in Star Trek Discovery, specifically Federation ships, and how they would actually be made, could be made to fit in with the Prime timeline. Suffice it to say, it's been quite some time since then. Not only have my views sort of changed and moderated a little bit, but also other people have since taken their crack at reimagining various Starfleet Discovery ships in different ways. And so with that in mind, I decided we'd revisit this topic. Uh, in particular, because I've got now an example, thanks to the uh, tireless and excellent work of Star Fox, we have now something to show you. What we've tried to do here is a proof of concept to show people what is possible with these Star Trek Discovery ships. A lot of people seem to take the attitude that the Federation ships that appeared in Discovery are just complete lost causes and they're completely anachronistic, they don't fit with the universe and we should just throw them in the trash and never talk about them again. But lots of other people, lots of very creative and talented people have put their effort into creating these ships and it's not their fault that they get misused. And also, even more creative people in the fandom have gone out of their way to improve and readapt these ships to make them fit much better. And indeed, if you just spend a few minutes looking on DeviantArt, you'll find more than a few different approaches. What we've done here, as you can tell from the topic of the video, is we've done a redesign of the Nimitz class. Now, why did we choose the Nimitz? Well, a, it's a personal favourite, B, it's probably the closest to fitting in, and also it's the most unique design. A lot of the other Discovery ships kind of fall into the same typical variations that we see. The Cardenius class is a four nacelle ship. The Malakowski class is just a centaur, basically. The Shepherd class is essentially a Lochnar class. These are very, very archetypal designs. There's nothing particularly unique here. But the Nimitz class represents a combination of being well thought out, but also still very much a fleet ship. And it occupies something of a unique position. It's different. Now, not radically different. It's not the McGee class. So what it ends up doing is sits in a very unique place and a kind of shows what can be done. And the other reason that we chose the Nimitz class is that no one else has really given it a good attempt. Lots of people have done the other ships. There's the uh, Kelvin style Shepherd class, which I think fits very nice. There's a TOS style Crossfield, which I think works very well. The other reason I want to try it with the Nimitz class specifically is because it's far less archetypal. It's got a very unique look. You compare it to, say, the Walker or the Shepherd, they're very simple ships when it really comes down to it. And so in that way, it's very easy to tweak them into something that, you know, uses original series parts, but is still that Discovery-style ship. With the Nimitz class, there's an awful lot of that Discovery DNA baked into it. So it takes a much more careful approach when it comes to readapting it to be more period appropriate. So with the Nimitz class, we basically have two options. We can TMPify it, which is the obvious thing to do, but then you lose its uniqueness because then it's just a Miranda with an extra set of nacelles. That's boring. You could TOSify it, but then you'd lose its identity. You take away all those very sharp geometric angles that make the Nimitz so striking and you turn it into this, you know, TOS era ship that doesn't really fit. It doesn't agree with its own aesthetic at that point. It's something that fundamentally can't fit in with the original series aesthetic. So what does that leave us? Will Phase 2 -ify it? The thing being with Phase 2 is... Phase 2 can use some expansion. A lot of people kind of dismiss the Phase 2 period as being unnecessary since we have the TOS and TMP eras, but there's 25 years between 
the launch of the original Enterprise in the 2240s, and her refit in 2270. You're really telling me that in all that time, there aren't further iterations of design going into what will eventually become the refit Enterprise? Of course there are. And the Phase 2 aesthetic gives us a good idea of how to approach that. Now, obviously, the Phase 2 Enterprise in and of, of itself is not canon, and it's probably likely that the Enterprise was maybe at one point intended to receive this refit, but something happened that basically meant that it wasn't worth refitting it, and they said, let's just wait until 2270 and refit it then. But other Constitution-class ships probably would be refitted to the Phase 2 standard, and then maybe they get their TMP refit further down the road. But as well as having refits of that period, you would also have scratch-built ships. Like the Miranda is a scratch-built ship for the TMP era, so is the Nimitz a scratch-built ship for the Phase 2 era. And as that, the Nimitz is an excellent candidate. Now, in terms of the design process, just a few notes that I kind of suggested was the following. So firstly, we decided we would be scaling it down. We went from 383 meters, and Star Fox actually in his rebuild takes it down to about 210 meters with about 10 decks. Other things that I felt were important in the redesign was to keep that dorsal superstructure. That's a very important part of the Nimitz's identity and gives it those very sharp, almost aeronautical, they feel like jet fighter angles, you know, that, those swept wings, as it were. Uh, we've mentioned before how, it, you know, possibly, hypothetically, maybe the entire that entire dorsal superstructure of the Nimitz can separate away and you have a very powerful warp sled there with those two very large nacelles at that point. It's just an idea. And so fundamentally, what I wanted to see with this design was to make sure that the basic lines that were created by the designer were built upon and div and expanded upon. I really wanted it to keep to the, as I would describe it, 1970s jet aesthetic. That sort of, again, little bit of a transition period. My kind, you know, I was kind of, when I was looking at it, I was kind of thinking of the F5 Tiger. You've got a little bit of that 60s in there and a little bit of that later, sharper look in there as well. And you want to kind of balance it out between the two. So you keep some of those kind of rounder, gentler shapes, some curves, but you also make sure that there's, you know, sharp, you know, aggressive angles in there, which, you know, tie it more into the TMP ships that will follow. But Venom, you say, this is all very good and jolly, but how does this ship fit in? How does it make sense in the universe? As you all know, my approach is always to try and get as many ships in as we possibly can. Yes, when we run into new ships, particularly with Discovery, we actually run into an instance where you've got a lot of ships fighting for that same position, and it's finding little ways to tweak each ship so as to make them unique and different and distinct and have their own role. Whether that's potentially shifting some ships into different eras. Little things like that to ensure that, you know, each ship has its place and each ship is unique, even when it is just reiterating on a similar design archetype. So when it comes to the Nimitz class, what I really see this doing is very much as what we saw it doing in its appearance in the show. I see it as being a command cruiser. It's smaller than a Constitution class, but it's got a lot of speed to it, and that's pretty important when you're a command ship. Command ships don't really want to be the biggest and heaviest ships, because they can get isolated and ganged up on. Whereas with something like a Nimitz, which is still powerful, but also very mobile, it's got the ability to stay out of danger, and really, when you're a command ship, that's the most important thing. And be where you are needed to be as quickly as you possibly can. Now, an interesting question would be whether or not the Nimitz class would fit a vertical core. Vertical warp cores are an iconic technology of the TMP era. And it's really up to personal preference as to whether or not you think during the Phase 2 era 
they had moved to using vertical warp cores or if that is something that is purely restricted to the 2270s refits. Uh, in any case, one of the things that we had to preserve from the original Nimitz was the fact that it was going to be a torpedo boat. The original Nimitz has an eye-watering number of torpedo launchers. The original Nimitz class features eight forward torpedo tubes and a further four aft torpedo tubes. This is, to say the least, excessive for this era. It's far in excess of what the Andor class would have, which is meant to be a later ship and is the primary torpedo boat of Starfleet. So it wouldn't feel right if this Nimitz had a greater torpedo complement than the most famous Starfleet torpedo boat. So instead, we adapted it so that it would have four forward torpedo tubes, as well as four extended range phasers. So these are long range phasers designed to reach out further than your standard phaser turret, and then two of each aft, which means that it still has a greater torpedo complement than the Phase II Enterprise or Phase II Constitution, but not quite as much as an Andor class, so that when the Andor class does come in, in the 2270s, this is then outmoded by that, and then potentially either upgraded or more likely replaced, as its role kind of falls out of service. So that's what ultimately would replace the Nimitz class, but what did the Nimitz class replace on its part? Well, for its part, the Nimitz class really served as an alternative to ships like the Proxima class, quad nacelle, you know, heavy starships, which were very, very powerful and impressive and expensive and uneconomical to run. This is a far more cheaper and reasonable alternative than a Proxima class. And while I think there would still be a few Proxima class ships hanging around in one form or another, I think the, the Nimitz class was probably a more practical alternative and more well-liked. I think the Proxima class was more of a prestige and propaganda thing than anything else. I think the Nimitz class for this period that we're looking at, which is probably around about 2255 to 2270, which would actually mean that this version of the Nimitz class could actually appear in that Discovery Klingon War, if you want that Discovery Klingon War to still be part of the timeline. That's personal preference. But really, that's it. This is our Phase 2 Nimitz class. Uh, let me know what you guys think. I think Star Fox has done excellent work, but the real key thing here is that it's not a dramatic change. We've not made any radical alterations here. This is still the same ship. Most of the superstructure is the same. It's literally slightly different engines and a coat of paint. That's it. That's all it needs. That's all it needs. So really what I want to say is when we see new starships that people have worked hard on, that really devoted and dedicated creative people have, you know, they've worked hard to make them happen. Even if you don't like it, and if you don't, and if you, and you feel like it doesn't fit, don't just discard it out of hand. Maybe take a step back, take a breath, divorce it from whatever it came from, and take another look at it. And if it really is that bad, think about how it can be improved while still respecting the intention of the designer, as I think that's something that we have successfully done with this Nimitz class. As I say, if we had gone and just TOSified it, that would have been easy, and that would have not really respected the aesthetic that the designer was going for. Whereas in what we have done, we've reconciled it, we've made it fit in the timeline much better, while also keeping as close as we possibly can to the designer's intentions. And at the same time, we're also expanding another era of Trek, which I think is always a big win. So let me know your thoughts in the comments below. If you have a favorite ship that you think doesn't get enough love and, and you think should get a bit of a, uh, a uh, paint job, a little bit of uh, beauty treatment, let me know in the comments below. And I will see you all in the next video. Thank you to my members, my Navarks, Jeffrey Ballard, Tully DT, Rella, 
and David Reeves. My commanders, Captain's Quarters, Chase Rector, PQSK, Philip Ty, Bird Monster, Jeff Hallam, Mark Philippe, Robert Sampson, Sean Farrell, Narata, Das Blas, Adam Bowman, Nathaniel Mead, DM, Tribal Typhoon, Gabe Logan, Mr. Flegel, Nicholas Walsh, Tom Zaros, and JC Tech Wizard. And I salute my centurions, Pendleberry, Marcus Hall, Julian Arnott, Freedom Trooper, Ocalcatum Quaesto, Squadra Course, John Nicole, Athies Collection, Tobias Klein, and Greg Martin. And I thank all my loyal sub lieutenants. Thank you guys for supporting the channel, and I will see you all in the next video.